Well, hi everybody. Time to read a new chapter in Shaking the Nickel Bush. We are on chapter nine. It is called Christmas Eve. The doctor at Globe charged me two dollars and a half, and when I asked him why it was so much, he said the extra 50 cents was for filling out the card. Everything was higher in Globe than it had been in Phoenix. They were charging 45 cents for meals in the restaurants, gasoline was 18 cents a gallon, and oil two bits a quart. When I'd bought the whole case of salmon, 50 pounds of cabbage, and 10 pounds of peanuts in Phoenix, I thought I'd had enough grub to last me for a month. But with the two of us eating out of it during most of the eight days we were up in the Salt River country, we were down to less than half a case of salmon, and of course, most of the gluten flour. Then, too, we decided to take Mr. Larson's advice about following the Gila River eastward. To do that, we'd have at least two days of driving through the San Carlos Indian Reservation where there'd be no chance of finding jobs. There was nothing to do except to lay in a supply of groceries at Globe, regardless of how high the prices were. While Lonnie was at the restaurant and I was waiting for the doctor to examine my specimen, I made out a list of the things we'd get, and I was careful to put on plenty of cheap things Lonnie could eat. A side of bacon, 10 pounds of dry beans, potatoes, and white flour for pancakes, and I remembered to put down dry yeast and baking powder. Even by getting the cheapest things I could think of, one orange crate of groceries cost over six dollars. It was getting along toward dark by the time we'd bought the groceries. There were only two days left till Christmas. I got to thinking about it while we were stowing the stuff along Shiftless's running board, and for a few minutes I thought it would be nice if I just went over to the dime store and picked up a few little things I could send my folks back home. Nothing expensive, but just any little things to let them know I remembered them at Christmas. Then I had to change my mind. In the first place, it would look pretty chintzy for me to be sending dime store presents after all the stuff I'd written Mother about having a fine job and plenty of money. Then, too, the postage would probably cost as much as the presents, and they wouldn't get there anyway till long after Christmas, and Shiftless's gas tank was nearly empty, and I was already down to $12.60. But I couldn't let just let Christmas go by without doing anything for anybody, so I gave Lonnie $3 and told him to go and get the gas tank filled and put two quarts of oil in the crankcase, and to buy another hotshot battery and see that we had plenty of air in the tires. Then I told him I had to go see a fellow about a dog, and then I'd meet him on that same corner in 20 minutes. As soon as Lonnie was out of sight, I beat it for a clothing store where I'd seen some pretty cheap prices in the window. The stuff they had was even cheaper th than the prices, but I got Lonnie a fairly decent pair of jeans and a blue shirt for $1.89. While we'd been fixing shiftless, he'd got so much grease on the ones he'd had that he looked more like a coal miner than a cow hand, and I was afraid that might hurt our chances of getting jobs, so I was really doing more for myself than I was for Lonnie. When he came past the corner, I was... When he came past the corner where I was waiting, I tossed the bundle on the back seat and jumped on the running board so we wouldn't have to come to a full stop. We only drove two or three miles out of Globe, then made camp for the night before crossing the line into the Indian Reservation. That night we went on a cooking spree. We built two campfires, and while Lonnie boiled beans and bacon in the dishpan, I baked him a batch of biscuits in the Dutch oven, mixed up what I thought was enough gluten dough to make a good-sized loaf, covered it with a dish towel, and set it near the fire to rise. Lonnie was going to have filled that dishpan half full of beans, but I knew better than that because I'd done some batching and found out how much they'd swell. My trouble was that I'd never tried to make any raised bread except the batch with the dead sourdough. I'd learned to bake biscuits when I was a water boy and cook's helper on the YB ranch, but I never had better luck than I did with the first batch I baked in the Dutch oven. I'd been too tight to buy any butter with our groceries, but fried some bacon so Lonnie could dip them in the hot fat. I watched him dip two or three biscuits and stow them away, then decided I might as well die of diabetes and starvation, so I dipped one myself. It was awfully good, and before we stopped, we'd eaten every last biscuit. While we were doing it, my bread dough went wild. When I first thought to look, it was the size of a basketball, and I didn't know what I should do to stop it from swelling anymore, so I got out Mother's recipe and read over it again. It said, let rise, knead, let rise again, and bake in a moderately hot oven. I couldn't knead the bread in the dishpan. Lonnie had it full of beans, and the only boards we had were those in the orange crates, but they were rough and covered with splinters. The only smooth thing I could find was the engine hood, so I washed it off, sprinkled a little flour as soon as it was dry, and kneaded the bread there. It worked to beat the band. So did the bread. As soon as I set it back by the fire for its second rising, it started growing. I let it go till it was nearly the size of a basketball again, then greased the inside of the Dutch oven, put the dough in, and crowded it down enough so I could get the lid on. Everything seemed to be going all right till I filled the lid with hot coals. It lifted a bit and began to teeter, so I scooped up handfuls of sand to put it on 
and put it on top of the coals to hold the lid down. That seemed to do the trick all right, so I heaped up more coals around the side of the pot and covered the whole works over with sand. Anyone might have thought it was a live dog I'd buried in the pile of sand. It squeaked and groaned and wiggled and looked as if the dog were trying to stick his head out. Of course, we know, knew the dough was still rising, but there was nothing we could do about it, so we just sat there till after midnight, waiting for the bread to get baked all the way through, and talking about Christmas coming in a couple of days, and about it's going to be easy finding jo jobs as soon as we've got down to the Gila Valley. I've wished ever since that I could remember just how I made that gluten bread. Of course, it got a necklace of sand where the top pushed up out of the pot, but that whittled off easy enough, and it was the best gluten bread I ever tasted. I'm sure the bacon grease I used for shortening didn't have anything to do with it, or kneading it on the engine hood, or covering the coals with sand instead of sod, because I tried all of those things a dozen times afterward, but the bread never came out so good again. The next morning I had Lonnie up and awake by 7 o'clock, and I let him have only pancakes, three strips of bacon, and coffee for his breakfast. I told him I didn't want to be tight, but it would have to be that way till we found jobs, that I was only, only going to eat one egg at a meal and make out the rest on gluten bread and peanuts with a little cabbage for supper. From where we camped that night, it was about 60 miles across from San Carlos Indian Reservation, and we'd planned to make the whole distance in a single day because there'd be no ranches where we could stop to look for jobs. For the first three or four miles, it looked as though we were going to make it. Then Shiftless went into a fit of shimmying. She'd always wandered more or less, but it had always been in sort of long, sweeping curves, and Lonnie had become so used to the feel of her that he could usually keep the curves from being very wide. But as soon as we got onto the Indian reservation that morning, she began wiggling her front wheels the way a pollywog wiggles his tail. If Lonnie tried to go more than five miles an hour, she'd shake herself like a wet dog. At first, Lonnie thought he might have put too much air in the tires, so we let a little out, but that didn't help a bit. Then, because we had to drive so slow, the fan wouldn't suck air through the radiator, so shiftless boiled like a tea kettle on a forge. At our first three or four stops, we drained out part of the boiling water and added fresh from the can we always filled when we reached a town or river. The only trouble was that we had to put in five times as much as we drained out. The rest had blown off in steam, and we'd already found out in Globe that we'd have a 25-mile waterless drive before we reached the Gila River. It took us till midnight to make the 25, and we'd used up every drop of water we had long before we got there. The next day, the boiling water didn't bother us so much because we were following the river and could get plenty of water to cool Shiftless down, but she wouldn't quit her shimmying. Even at that, we thought we'd be able to make Fort Thomas for Christmas Eve, but we couldn't do it. It was just turning dark when we left the reservation and passed the little flag station at Geronimo. Halfway between there and Fort Thomas, one of our front tires whistled like wind around the eaves of a barn. By the time we were stopped, it was flatter than a dropped egg. Between the shimmying and the rough gravel of the road, the rubber of both front tires had been filed away till the canvas lining showed through. I thought we were finished. Even with the change Lonnie had brought back after he bought the gas, I had less than $8 in my pocket, and I was sure a new tire would cost more than that. Lonnie got down on his hands and knees, lit matches, and felt all along the tread of the tire. We ain't bad off, he shouted after a minute or two. We ain't bad off at all, buddy. It just blowed out a little hole no bigger than a lead pencil. Jeepers creepers, I wished I remembered to bring along a vulcanizing set and a boot. I could fix this old baby up so she'd run another thousand miles. How much would that one cost? I asked him. Well, he said, a good one would cost three, four bucks, but I could patch this little old hole up with a five cent rubber plug and a ten cent tube of rubber cement, and I could make a good enough boot by sticking in a piece of old shoe sole. How far do you reckon it is from here to Fort Thomas? According to the map, it ought to be three or four miles, I told him. Give me two bits and go to getting supper ready, he told me. I'll hoof it into town and be back by the time you got the grub cooked. We drove shiftless off the road. I gave Lonnie the quarter, and he was starting off down the road toward Fort Thomas when I remembered it was Christmas Eve. I wasn't a bit sure he'd be able to fix the tire when he got back, and it seemed to me that we'd probably have to spend Christmas Day right where we were. Then we'd have to decide which would sell first, our outfits or shiftless. That was what made me call Lonnie back. I knew how much he'd hate to part with either, and if we were going broke anyway, we might as well go in style. When he got back to me, I passed him two dollars and said, Tomorrow's Christmas. You can spend all of that for our dinner. A good fat chicken we can roast with all the trimmings. Cheapers, creepers, he shouted, grabbed the true dollars, and started away at the road down a trot. Started away down the road at a trot. I found some good dry greasewood for the fire, put a head of cabbage on to boil, and a pot of water for coffee. There wasn't any sense in warming up what was left of Lonnie's beans and bacon until he came back, and I could bake him some biscuits while he was fixing the tire, so there was nothing for me to do but sit and wait for him. But just waiting was no good because I couldn't stop thinking, and there wasn't much comfort in thinking right then. 
Just to have something to kill time with, I got the clay bucket and box of sticks and wires out of shiftless. Then I sat down beside the fire and began twisting up a little armature for a horse. As we'd come through the reservation, I'd seen an old Indian pony standing out on the desert, three-legged with his old head hung nearly to the ground. I felt about the way that old pony looked, and before I realized what I was doing, I found myself bending an armature for a horse standing just as he had been. The light from the greasewood fire was good, and I dug deep into the bucket to find some clay that wasn't dried out too much. It had just the right feel about it, and when I began working it onto the armature, it slipped under my thumb like wet silk. I fished around in the box till I'd found most of the little tools I'd whittled in Phoenix and began scraping and shaping the clay the way I wanted it. I didn't try to make a nice smooth job of it, but let the tools pull on the clay a bit, so as to make it rough like that old pony's hair. I put a big hay belly on him and sprung knees and a bone spav and below one hawk. I was so busy with the old pony that I didn't hear Lonnie when he came back. I didn't know he'd been gone more than a few minutes when, from right above my shoulder, he said, Jeepers creepers, buddy. That's the engine pony we seen on the little hill this afternoon. Why didn't you tell me you could do that stuff? What's the sense, I said. It wouldn't help us to find a job nor to find tires for shiftless. I only do it when I've got time to kill. I've whittled them out of wood since I was a little kid. How did you make out? Well, I've did worse, he chuckled and dropped two big fat hens down beside me. I got sweet potatoes and celery and onions and a pie. I had to snitch the vegetables off in a sidewalk stand. The pie was four bits. It's mints. And by the looks of these hens, you snitch them too, I said. Look, buddy, I had to, he told me. I wasn't going to leave Christmas go by without getting you nothing. As he spoke, he fished into his hip pocket and brought out a real nice jackknife and passed it toward me. It ain't much, he said, but it might do for whittling horses. I knew that knife had cost at least a dollar, so before I reached for it, I asked, Did you swipe that too? Buddy, he said, you ought to know me better than that. I wouldn't steal stuff. Not out of a store or nothing, but chickens, that's different. A man's got to eat. That time I put my arm around Lonnie's neck and told him he was my buddy, and I didn't say another word about his having swiped most of our Christmas dinner. While I was warming up his beans and putting the coffee on to boil, he sat holding the little clay Indian pony, looking at it and turning it over in his hands. Could you make one of these here with a good rider on it? He asked. Sure, I told him, but it wouldn't be much good. As soon as the clay dried, it would dried, it would warp out of shape and crack. Without a rider, I can cast one in plaster so it will last forever, or until it gets dropped, but that would be too tough tough a job to cast one with a rider. The hat brim and the reins wouldn't come out of the mold clean, and the least little bump would break them. Lonnie was still looking at the little horse when I dished up his beans and poured the coffee. How long does it take to cast one in plaster, he asked. Oh, a couple of days in dry country like this, I said. One to dry the mold and one to dry the casting. Why? Nothing, he said. I was just thinking. Will this one here last over Christmas? Sure, I told him, if I keep a damp rag around it. It'll last as long as the clay's kept moist. Well, hadn't you best to wrap it then before we have our supper? You could use one of them dish towels. There's one of them ain't too dirty. Before he'd touch a bite, Lonnie got out the cleaner of our two dish towels, wet it at the water can, wrung it out, and wrapped the little clay horse as carefully as if it had been a sick bird. After he'd stowed it away in the grub box, I tossed him the package with his shirt and overalls in it and said, There's something Santa Claus left while you were gone to town. It's funny how happy you can be over just little things and how quickly you can forget all about your troubles. Neither Lonnie nor I could sing worth a whoop, but we both knew a few old Christmas songs, mostly hymns we'd heard at Sunday school. With the moon hanging over the mountains beyond the river and a coyote barking somewhere up the valley, we sat by our little fire and sang till we were sure it was past midnight. Then we shook hands, told each other Merry Christmas, and turned in as if we didn't have a worry in the world. And that is the end of chapter nine. Bye-bye, everybody.